All right, so today we are going to work on creative classes. And the theme of today's training will be how to turn a power yoga class into a gentle yoga class and how to turn a gentle yoga class into a power, power yoga class. And one thing that I find is really helpful is one, identifying them in the yoga anatomy book, whether you have the first edition, which I prefer, the second edition, which is also good. And at the very front of the book, you'll see in the contents that they, they organize these as standing, sitting, kneeling, supine, prone, and arm support balances. So this would, when I got a hold of this, I thought that's genius. I never, I mean, I just got this maybe a couple years ago and I thought, what a great way to build our creative classes. So <clears throat> whenever you do a creative class, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is decide if it's gonna be standing, sitting, kneeling, supine, prone or arm support, because it's only four postures. It's not a whole entire class. And if you do that, then let's say today we'll do um, <clears throat> we'll do standing since the theme is power to gentle and gentle to power. And sometimes it can be hard to pull off a gentle class when it's standing, right? So the idea is then if we fill out a few of these together and we will, that maybe in the class that we put together today, the 60 minute format that includes an intention, um, it includes a warm up of some sort. I like Sun A. You can't go wrong with that. Just warm them up with Sun A. It also gives you a chance to just kind of, you know, um, break break into the, the class a little bit, get into your zone. I, you can do other things, but I like Sun A for newer teachers until you've got it down a little. And then like three or four of these creative classes will be your sequencing. And then at the back side of it, we still need a cool down. We'll likely get them to the ground, not in every place, but you know, corporate yoga, outside yoga, maybe you don't bring them to the ground, but assuming today that we bring them to the ground, <clears throat> you know, there'll be the cool down and then lots of time for the Shavasana for the meditation, right? And then also another maybe five minutes after Shavasana ends to get them up, kind of come alive with, you know, maybe some seated movements, maybe arm floats or something along like this, and then hands to prayer, namaste, so on. And then at that point, I, I personally hear it as when we run classes, I like five minutes to pass before the top of the hour after that. So really all that I've described is really 55 minutes rather than 60. And I think that if you give your class 55 minutes rather than 60, if there's another class right behind you, you know, then there's just five minutes for people. Also, I think a social side of it, people have five minutes to just chit chat with each other. They've got it in their mind that they're going to be with you from 12 to 1. And if you wrap it up at 1255, not 1240, but 1255, you know, then they may be more inclined to say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I think I've been seeing you in this class. Are you normally here? Like, hopefully start to like build the sangha, build a community amongst each other, which goes away once we start running late for class. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. Even if it's only a few minutes, I think um, if a student is looking to, I'm gonna get yoga in for a time today, but then I have A, B, and C to do after, there's a trust there that you're gonna end on time. That's as important as you'll start on time. So, you know, with me, I know oftentimes starting on time is important, but if given the choice between the two, ending on time is more important to me. If I, if I must pick, I'd rather end on time. And then that way, if my students have somewhere to be there after, you know, they could be there after. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. So today, uh, if you wanna open up to one of the creative classes, we're not gonna name the class yet. We're gonna do that like at the very end. <clears throat> now, upper left-hand corner, we're just gonna write standing. Okay, and so when we're done with these, we should be able to teach the same exact sequence as a power yoga class or as a gentle yoga class. 
And the difference will simply be how many times we repeat the asana, if it's a power yoga class, versus how slow and silky we move through the same asana in a gentle yoga class that would have far more invitations for modifications into it and air and space around each asana. It's really all it is. Like you could take, see, I mean, without going, you know, off the rails with like birds of, of paradise or something, probably wouldn't be fitting to put and do a gentle yoga class. But most of the postures that you see in here could actually be in a gentle yoga class. Um, I mean, we'll come across some where I'm like, all right, no, not that one. <laughs> but I think the other way that we consider how do we put programming together that we can work towards mastery is the cues we use, how do we want, or what do we want the students to do? And the qualities, how do we want them to go about doing it? So there in lies the difference between the power and the gentle. How do we want them to do it? So those qualities are commonly just words, like it's a word bank. And there we have the word bank in Teachable at michellerayzobi.com. You know, it would probably behoove you to hit up that word bank. Maybe we'll even do that today. If we feel thirsty, we'll see how it all shakes out. Um, but really, I go to thesaurus.com to keep my verbiage fresh and new. And I feel that it's, it's more of a gift to my students to, instead of coming up with new sequencing, new sequencing, new sequencing, which I, I know with as many classes you've done, how laborious that is, you know, can we rework a creative class snippet, change the style of yoga that it is, style of yoga being power, restorative, gentle, hatha, yin, right? Changing the style of the yoga. And maybe we do fewer postures and maybe each week we, we switch out one snippet for one we created a couple of weeks ago or create a new one that day. Um, Students have really respond to this because it gives people a chance at mastery. And I think that that's why Vikram yoga, hot yoga is so popular and timeless. Anybody that I've talked to, most people I've talked to, I'm like, what about that is attracted to you? Because me, I'm at a loss, right? And so they say, usually, it's nice to see where I am when I go regular. You know, you can see the benchmark moving in bits by regular attendance. And the same is true with sun salutations A and sun salutations B, which is your traditional sun salutations that goes back thousands of years and nobody's bored of yet, right? And so we're still doing those things. And again, like, can we find how it feels to get into a posture? Let's say we're doing a simple series like, um, like a plank to a chaturanga to an up dog, to a down dog, back to the plank. So we'll make that our first one. So posture number one uh, will be the plank. Posture number two, chaturanga. Posture number three, upward facing dog. And posture number four, downward facing dog. Okay, so nothing about this, this sequence ex is so exciting that it's setting anybody's world on fire, right? But at the same time, if you spend the time and attention on how you are asking your practitioners to do this, and what cues and qualities and themes you've built in, I think that's what makes it fun and fancy, you know? Um, so let's say, well, we were, this didn't really work out because I was in, I was in standing. So we're going to cross out standing and we're going to make it prone because we are not standing in this particular creative class. All right, so prone, face down. We've got plank, we've got chaturanga, we've got upward facing dog and downward facing dog. Flip the page to the next one and write standing on that. We'll do standing for that one. You guys can catch me if I uh, miss that. Okay, so since we have a prone piece, it makes sense to have the prone programming as part of your cool down or towards the end of the class. 
So if we're starting off the class in standing and we're doing that for a time. So let's say we did our intention. We did sun salutations A to warm them up. And then we did some standing postures. At some point, we need to start to get them back down to the mat. And I think the prone positions are the ones that the instructors um, maybe don't have is so readily in their back pocket. Like I don't, I don't have that many is kind of what I hear a little bit. So if you have just like the sun A, if you have a sequence that your practitioners are used to doing, then they might benefit from that same idea of, oh, this is our, this is our cool down. We're used to doing this, we've done this, and so on. So um, if you move to play, posture number one being plank, I think that this core strengthener, if you're in a power class, right, the cue you would use would maybe be shoulders over wrists, you know. And then the qualities will depend, on, will depend on how we want to do it. So since we're starting off with a power yoga class, so jump up to name of class and write power yoga. Right? How do we want people to do it? So I would probably bring my awareness for a power yoga class on, you know, uh, wrap the core, of course, that's there. We'll write that. That always needs to be there comma, but I would say bring the attention on opening up the chest. Because if we're doing that, we're, we're looking at a fuller expressure, exp expression of plank, then let's say if the knees are down and the toes are up and we've got this other gentle one, and we will create that scenario on a different creative class in a couple of minutes. Um, but wrap the car, uh, the core and uh, open the chest. So I think that when we open the chest, it brings the practitioner's awareness away from maybe how they look or how they feel or how they're doing, right? Maybe I'm not good at this is a dialogue that we often hear when plank rises in a studio. Instead, can we find a way to open up the chest of this power yoga class? So it doesn't mean we're not going to invite them to drop to the knees for a rest at any time. So let's go down to modifications and drop to knees. So if your practitioners know that it's not so much that you want them to hold the plank for as long as possible, although I, I'm always down for like a plank challenge, that's, that's my jam, you know? Um, but outside of that, if what you're really looking for is an opening within the chest, I think it changes the mentality of what you're asking the practitioners of in the pose. Their knees can come down at any time. And then the sister pose, so under posture number one, next to plank in parentheses, right sister pose, child's pose. So developing this one little segment here, right? So we're packing and unpacking and packing rather than let's put a whole bunch of brand new programming, you know, together just today. On different days, we'll do that. But on this day, we're really going to unpack this experience. What's going on within the body when we do it? So if you invite somebody to come into plank and let's say they have rotator cuff surgery or they're just not feeling plank for whatever reason, right? We want to be able to offer sister postures but we don't want to then walk them through the cues and the qualities and the modifications of said sister posture. So it might sound something like, let's all come to, into a nice plank with our shoulders over our wrists because that's first order of business, protect those wrists, right? Uh, as we move into our plank, we'll come into it with a nice strong core. Those of you that prefer to take a child's pose, feel free, come back. So it's a, it's a, it's a short journey and a quick jump back. Right. And then that way they know like, oh, oh thank you, <laughs> you know, rather than the anxiety that might rise when we're walking the, the practitioner through all of these steps. And meanwhile, they're freaking out like, I don't have blank in me today, 
you know, so give them the sister pose early. If it's a, you would, I would consider a more seasoned pose um, or a more athletic pose because it plank in itself and so right isn't necessarily a hard yoga posture, but it is an athletic one. So we would, it would be fitting to have a sister pose there. Um, so, okay, so once we're, once we're hanging out, we've got their shoulders over their wrists. We've told them to wrap the car, the core, we're bringing in some pranayama and stuff. And now we're going to really even change our cadence of our voice to enhance the featured spotlight at the movies. All right, let's open the chest in this space, right? Like let them know, like, this is what we're aiming to do. So some differences you'll see is you might see some people having a roundedness, almost like a cat in their spine in order to obtain this. And the problem with that is that <clears throat> the shoulders are no longer over the wrists. It's really hard to get the shoulders over the wrist and also around the spine. It's just an awkward thing the body doesn't tend to do. The body tends to do those kinds of things when the hands are going here or here or here or here or here. And then also just from a perspective of pulleys and levers, anything that is in alignment from your midline of your body <clears throat> has less chance of getting injured because it's in anatomical alignment, we're just strengthening that. <clears throat> so in the invitation to the open up the chest, therein or if not already before, at any time, feel free to drop to the knees. So let's talk about language, how that could sound. And we'll see how they go about, uh, how, how they go about doing it in books well. Um, <clears throat> today, let's move into our plank, nice and strong, shoulders over wrists, everybody. Uh, if plank isn't in your practice today, feel free to take a child's pose or any other posture that works for you. And I think the delivery of that idea <clears throat> is tea. I think hot tea would help with honey. Come on. <laughs> I think the delivery of that idea is that you don't have a preference. You don't prefer if they do plank or if they do child pose. And I think that that approach to delivering a yoga class is why I, I personally don't, don't like Bikram yoga you know, myself, but it's great for a lot of people for a long list of reasons. But for me, I approach yoga in such a way of, can we invite ourselves into this space? And can we give permission to move out of this space and do what's right for you today, which is the sum of who I am. But not everybody likes that, of course, to keep that in mind. But if you do offer up a sister pose, try and do so in, in a tone that reflects you don't have a preference if they do or don't. The same idea would go for modifications. So same thing. So we're in our plank, shoulders are over wrists. Feel free to drop to the knees. What I'm really looking for is opening up that chest. What could that look like? Maybe you drop to your knees for a moment so you can square up the shoulders right over the wrists. Find that opening through the chest. Find a bit of lengthening through the neck. And at that point, if you have like a chakra themed class or something, you could even invite in, you know, throat chakra. Or if you're coming at this, you know, anatomically, you could even say you massage the thyroid or both, you know, whatever lingo you use. But again, the same concept goes when offering alternatives. I highly recommend not having a preference. And it doesn't reflect on you as a teacher. So I've seen that through the years, you know, teachers will teach and they look out and the students are all kind of not doing what they're asked to do. And then they say, uh, what I do wrong, they weren't doing it, right? Um, and I think I know I've done my job when I look out and I see everybody's doing something a little bit differently. That's how I know. So hopefully that is helpful to you. Um, in this case, since it's a power yoga class and not a gentle yoga class, I'm not going to drone on forever about drop to the knees, you know, the way I just did. That would be a little bit more the style in the gentle yoga class, and we will get to that, and we will do that today. Um, so, okay, so go ahead and open up the book to Plank. And in the back, the table of contents is in Sanskrit first, but then in English I discovered after some time. And I was quite delighted. I was, oh, what a bonus. Uh, okay, so Plank. 
which I think is four limbed hose. I am not mistaken. We got four limb stick hose. 182 will be into our chaturanga. Okay, coming back to 182. And that's in the first edition, otherwise you'll have to um, find it. Yeah, and you can find it that way. Um, okay, so for the purpose of sequencing, create a class. I put this and downward facing dog in prone face down. In it, an entire sequence of arm support series, I would do is like a workshop. You know, I wouldn't belt out four postures of arm balances unless it was like a workshop experience. So in this case, as we move into our chaturanga, we're prone, we're face down, four limb stick pose. And here the key thing is that she has the elbows over the wrist. And in every other way, this posture looks like a plank. So I'll give you a minute just to study a little bit. Could you imagine what would be different if she straightened out her elbows, as demonstrated here? What would change? Or would it look like a plank? So, under posture number two, since we're still in a power yoga class, our cue is going to be elbows over wrists. But I would invite you to have the qualities remain the same as our plank just did. So let's write that in, wrap the core, open the chest. And that's just a style of teaching. It doesn't have to be where you land or what you decide is right for you when you decide to offer your classes. But I think it, it, it's that same mentality that we've been threading throughout of can we, can we learn through repetition, right? So let's find our chaturanga from our plank. We're all going to slowly, slowly lower down and invite the elbows over the wrists. And let's keep that core nice and wrapped as we did before. And you already know you can bring your knees down at any time. For those of you that want to take child's pose, feel free, right? Once there, take a nice deep breath, maybe some pranayama work in here, not too long. The pranayama work idea would come after the offerings of a sister pose, <laughs> right? Because it's holding this posture for a long time. And can we find that same opening of the chest that we had in our plank plank skill? And I think that that's how you move the bar from one end to another and to allow your practitioners to, um, I think Amy often quotes, and I, I won't get it exactly right, but it's something like um, very small movements, very little, very few movements in many, many places, very small movements in many places is the concept. Right, so if we completely change our cues and qualities from our plank to our chaturanga, if we totally change everything, it'll sound zazzy, right? But I don't know that it will really give your students a chance to move towards mastery. You know, and I think the latter, it can really serve your practitioners, especially when we're talking about um, postures that are as engaging as this. Uh, when you look at the, the primary muscles here, what's highlighted in red is the muscles working. And when you see them highlighted in blue in this book, that's what's making contact with the floor. So if we look at our anatomy here, if we were to drop the knees down, then we would have less engagement in the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius for sure but we would still have a nice stretch and even a, even a bigger stretch through the front of the hip flexors there, through the hamstring or through quads in the front, because there's actually a, a, a bigger space between the knee and the pelvis when we drop the knees down. 
So it's not that the easier pasture isn't as good and we're trying to get to the full pasture. It's what is it we want to happen anatomically to the body for the practitioner and how do we guide them through the practice? And I think that repetition piece really shows up to allow them to bring what you've taught them to their, pra their personal practice at home when you're not with them. And it has been said, and, and it's, it's kind of a bummer from the business side of things, but um, it has been said that the best teachers uh, lead their students through an asana that they don't, they're not dependent on the teacher anymore, right? So is it good for business? Yes, because they'll tell their friends, right? And so thinking of it that way, um, if we can lead our practitioners to be able to take their home practice, you know, or maybe if they find themselves lovely, like recently I went to Star Rock, it was really nice, I was able to take practice, and just having that in your back pocket, I think that that's far more readily achieved for your students if you, if you have some layer of repetition within the training. You know, it's less jazzy, but I think it's more serving. So these are some things to consider. Um, <clears throat> as we go into modification, I think we voted. Ballots were sent out. Drop the knees on this one too. So you can jot that in, drop the knees. And then next to Chaturanga, put a parentheses in sister pose, child's pose. Okay, so since we voted that this is a power yoga class, we'll spend more time on the qualities, which basically boils down to the advancements of the movements in many cases, and less time on the modifications, but we'll never leave them out. And, and the truth of the matter is, I think that, you know, Edge has always done so well in that everything is all levels. It doesn't matter what brings you here. We don't have some specialty yin yoga teacher training that's different than this training. It's just a different page on the creative class, you know, and how we go about approaching a class so that it meets up with the purpose of yin yoga versus power or gentle, in this case being power, of course. So I think the, the key things that get that done are the sister poses and the qualities. Got it? Um, okay, for posture three and posture four, we're now moving from an axial extension where our spine is nice and straight to, um, to a back bend. So as we move into a hyper extension of the back, I feel like with back bends, because so many people have things happening with their gifts. And it, typically the L4, L5 region, lower, lower region of the lumbar spine. Um, so many people have that. I always put extra attention on a sister pose if it's going to be a back bend. I do. So in this way, I would say, I might even meander off into some kind of conversation like I do. So sister poses, and I'll give you a little list. It might be a sphinx. It might be a cobra. Uh, it might be a crocodile. Right? So the way I usually cue this is I cue them from a sphinx. So the forearms are down. And I can often do that from the Chaturanga. So from the Chaturanga, for those of you that want to come down onto your forearms, feel free. It might be more comfortable for your wrists. We'll meet you there in a moment. So it lays the groundwork to let them know we're headed there anyway. You feel free to have at it sooner if you'd like. So picking up from that moment in class, they're in their Chaturanga. We've invited them to come down into a sphinx, right? We're not calling it out or anything like that. We're just letting them know that they're coming down onto their forms if they want to. And if they did, they're pretty much headed into sphinx. That's naturally what's going to happen. Some might do so with knees up or knees down. I would not get into all of that just yet, right? Uh, that would be what posture three isolated experience would be about. 
So I think, again, even in delivering the information to your students, while I'm giving you the why behind it, much like edition two of this book, you'll only want to give the what, which is found in edition one of this book. And that being the difference between I went to yoga class today and I'm in yoga teacher training, <laughs> right? You want that. So I might say from our Chaturanga, we did the thing, we went through that. And then I might say, for those of you that want to come down onto your forearms and give your wrists a break, feel free. We'll meet you there in a moment. Everyone in the class knows that's about to happen. So find your skinks here. And so cues would be come down, two forearms, right? And then posture three, the qualities. What if we kept the qualities the same? What if we still wanted to wrap the core and open the chest? So let's write that, wrap the core, open the chest. So if we start them off on Sphinx, then from that space, we can give them the following choices. They can straighten the arms once again, which was the difference between the plank and the chaturanga. So it's a familiar movement. We've just done this. Only our hips are on the ground now. That's really the only thing that's changed, right? We can continue to invite them to drop the knees, which is the modification, drop the knees. And then once there, because we're headed towards upward facing dog, because we've decided it's a power yoga class, so understanding why you're asking your practitioner to do what they're doing because of that, then we wouldn't take a long time to say, all right, let's, for those of you that want to come along into upward facing dog, for those of you that want to stay in Sphinx, feel free, but those of you that want to come along to upward facing dog, let's start by straightening the arm. So then come down onto the forearms would be slash straighten arms. Because that's the only real thing, if you totally unpack this, that's going to change between these two different ideas. So let's find upward facing dog, page 178. Okay. And if you have the second edition, then you might see more blue where we see the contact of where, um, where what meets the floor. So for this one, I think what we're really trying to do is get the stretch between the neck and the diaphragm. So why don't you take two minutes to just read through Upward Facing Dog in this book, and then we'll pick up from there. I know we like need to get back to it, right? Need the egg timer. I don't actually know if it's been done. That's what I say, guys. done. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so we have gone from our sphinx to our board facing dog by straightening the arms and also 
lifting the knees off the ground. If we straighten the arm, but we didn't leave, lift the knees off the ground, we have found cobra, right? If we want something a little more passive, we may invite our practitioners to stack the forearms on the ground, invite the forehead to the forearms and find a nice passive crocodile. For your more seasoned yogis, they may find themselves in this, you know, elaborate, joyous, full expression of crocodile, and that's great. You probably wouldn't find me guiding practitioners through that entire experience, because I don't know that it meets the entire class, you know, um, percentage-wise in all probabilities. Those that have it in their practice likely will take it on the line. Um, and again, that's my approach. Your approach does not have to be this. Your approach is your approach. This is how I'm doing it. Um, but we're still sticking with dropping at the knees. <clears throat> so we have some sister poses for upward facing dog and they are Sphinx, Cobra, Crocodile. So if you haven't jotted that down, you want to. Um, under cues, I've written, come down to the forearms slash straighten the arms. And I've, I've used my qualities in a different way that you, than you've seen me instruct in the past to support the power yoga theme, right? Since it's kind of the essence of what we're getting at today. So we're going to stick with that. Let's, let's keep that core nice and wrapped while we'll do this. And this, this one's probably more important than the rest in that it helps protect the lumbar spine by wrapping the core, that core engagement. Uh, so we want to have that happen. And then again, can we find that openness into the chest? And I think that that repeat sequencing, again, invites your practitioners to go on a journey with you through their asana, but have a meeting place that they know. And you, you may not nail this down all in one day. You know, this takes time to refine and hone and everything else like that. But I mean, to at least have it in your mind that you're aiming towards some sort of theme is, is what makes a good class great, in my opinion. Um, okay, and the modifications, the only thing that's different than above is drop the knees or lift the knees. For up dog, because it's not an up dog unless the knees are up dog. So different lineages are going to see it different ways. As you see Amy demonstrate this particular one, the knees are on the ground. However, if you continue to flip through the pages and see um, some of the, I will use the word advanced movements found in subsequent pages, you know, I think that there's kind of, um, I think there's kind of, there's layman's terms, and then there's also um, what's accessible to the majority that I commonly would speak to. And then there's matter of lineages and what practitioners have come to know to become valid into a class. And at the end of that, it's gonna be up to you. So if you caught the photo shoot that uh, Monica did, she did peacock pose in page 190. So if you go there or head over to the table of contents, if, you, if you're looking for it from the second edition. The work we've done in this power class would prepare the body for something like peacock pose. So at the bottom, at the very, very bottom, just write fun, apex equals peacock in free time. And I'll repeat that. The very, very bottom right, fun apex equals peacock in free time. And we'll get to that after the downward facing dog. So the general gist of this is if you went through and compared the muscle usage from these three postures, posture one, two, and three, it would prepare the body to move into a peacock pose. Now, Obviously, we would want to put either a sister pose here 
But honestly, you know where I think Peacock, Peacock Pose best serves the practitioner is in free time. So let's say the structure of the class is we've set an intention. We've warmed them up with sun salutations A, because that's the easy go-to and it takes care of itself, right? And then we have a sequence of our creative classes, two, three, four, depending on how quick you're going. And then we're doing a warm up, or I mean, sorry, we're doing a cool down. We're bringing the, the class down. And then maybe a little free time in there. You could put that free time before the cool down or after the cool down. And I would say like, not five minutes, five minutes is a long time just to let students just like do something for five minutes unguided, you know? <laughs> but three to five minutes, depending if you know your audience. So if you, these are regular students that you see on a weekly basis and that's you know how you've structured your formatting, then five minutes is a delightful amount of time to let them go about it in a way that they want to go about in it. Um, and so that is the place that I would put poses such as these, right? So we're face down still, we're prone. Um, okay, in there, before doing all of this wrist work, we saw it in plank, we saw it in chaturanga, we saw it in upward facing dog, we straightened the arms. There's a lot of wrist work. I like the downward facing dog. One, it counters all of that, that, that um, wrist work, but also the back bend we found in upward facing dog, it counters it with a flexion coming forward. So posture number four will be downward facing dog. I gave you the spiel about peacock prior to that, because I don't know that it's true that downward facing dog helps prepare the body for peacock as much, but it does provide maybe maybe a little muscular rest. So if we exhaust them in this series, particularly if we've repeated it, and then ask for peacock, <laughs> how's about a dog dog or a child folks in there, you know? And then an invitation to do a little bit of playtime, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so going to downward facing dog, which is also in, um, in the arm support, category in this book, but I put it as prone for a creative class. And if you can't find that, that is standing up solo, downward facing dog, 176. Okay. So quite a bit going on with the uh, with the downward facing dog. Let's move through the postures, um, the cues. I would say hips to sky, and some people would call that equality, and that and that's fine too. You guys have both been training with me long enough, where I think you guys are getting the idea that we can slide the bar between qualities and cues based on our language patterns. Uh, the reason I would make the cue hips to sky is that there's this tendency for students to want to get their feet as far back and their arms as far forward as possible and, and use the expansiveness of the length of the mat. Uh, some have expressed the reason they do that is because they look over and, you know, this gal has this, this, you know, this glorious, like vast downward facing dog and that's, that's what they're after. But that has more to do with limb length, you know, than anything. And so what I would like to see out of the downward facing dog is the engagement of the muscles on the sole of the foot. So if you look at your anatomy book here, I'm on page 176, you might have to check your table of contents to look at yours. The feet are commonly highly underdeveloped, especially if they live in shoes. As yogis, we lock out this way. This helps us, right? Yay, it's one of the perks. However, oftentimes we live in shoes. And the, the idea behind it, if you're walking through like say a mountain posture is finding the grounding at the soles of the feet, finding an even distribution of the weight between the left and right side, moving that up the body as you go, what engages, what happens and so on, right? And then from there, can we find a lengthening like from the crown of the head as though the top of our head were attached to a string like a marionette doll, you know? And then that would be like an inlay of the flower and language that you start to see 
in yoga classes that's so luscious and, and nice, but that comes later. You learn this first, right? <laughs> So get that going. So that then means that um, I see oftentimes, and even I do it sometimes, is the modification given for this posture is to bend at the knees. And I don't really subscribe. Um, I feel like it takes away from the key things we're trying to have happen. I feel like it also gravely moves away the muscles that we were engaging when we bent the knees. There's such a shift on so many fronts. There's such a shift. Um, I would rather see a cue, and we'll write the quality, invite the weight to the back of the body. So write that under the quality. Invite your weight to the back of the body. All right, what happens then? Let's give it a moment to contemplate that idea. We're inviting the weight to the back of the body. It's more likely that the feet are gonna to wanna to go to the ground. So just naturally, the practitioner might kind of be heading in that direction a little bit, and then you come in for refinement. So you might say, for those of you that are looking for that yummy stretch up the back of the leg, Let's maybe just bend one leg at a time and hold there. And then give it some time. This is where flowery language is great. Throw it in there, meaningless fluff. But it's so powerful in that you're giving your practitioner something to concentrate on while they might be doing what they would describe as very hard work. And that's a lovely service. So not to underrate flowery language, but there's a place for it. And it cannot, it cannot be instead of what's going on with the polarity lovers of the body and also empower your student to understand their practice. So um, why well, should say cannot, very unlikely ever does. <laughs> it's, my, it's my take on it. So invite your way to the back of the body. Let's pedal those heels a bit, shall we? And then invite them to hold it. So like when we think about yin yoga, the idea behind yin yoga, the reason it's so effective is we're stretching out the connective tissue and we're holding it long enough that if we let go, it remains lengthened. And if we're always in movement all the time, we don't get that. It's going to recoil back. Do you need to get into all that with your students in class? No, maybe from time to time, if it's your apex pose and you're going to kind of unpack pose today, like, oh, today we're going to do a power yoga class. Our apex pose is going to be downward facing dog. So we'll unpack that a little more. It should be fun. You know, let them know. But I wouldn't do that for all your postures. That would just be too much. Um, so with that then being said, we could pedal the feet. And I would almost make that rest pose still child pose or puppy. You can, you can take your your choice. Maybe for our gentle yoga class in the same exact series, we choose puppy. And that'll make sense when we get into that. It doesn't already. So modification is pedal the feet. Which is different than bend the knees. We're still getting that lengthening through the back of the legs. So many people need it. We do so much time sitting in a chair, commonly hamstrings are short, with it tugs and pulls on the pelvis, low back, uh, resulting in um, quad dominance, quads are super strong, hamstrings are super tight, and we have this un uneven tug and pull all day long on the body. And so what the body really wants to do, and, and then we'll break it, then we'll workshop this, and after we workshop that, we'll play on how to make it uh, a gentle yoga class. But essentially, we want to try and find homeostasis in our body. Your, your human form wants that. And even if homeostasis is just standard quo, even if standard quo isn't good, let's say standard quo is, I get my phone because I'm really dedicated to the offering the visual. Even if status quo is this, your body will hunger for this because that's what it knows. 
doesn't mean that that's anatomical and it or good for the body. It's just what it knows. It's just what it's used to. So I think that if we present a class that invites the body towards homeostasis and that pattern through repetition becomes one of anatomical alignment, then they might find better posture when they're seating, um, more mindfulness and where their limbs are. Let's say one I use often is crossing the legs. You know, when I come into comfortable cross-legged pose, at least every other time, I guess, I say, you know, let's take whichever leg was on top and put that one on bottom. And if you cross your legs in life, do that as well, right? Because we do this, this, this leg crossed over that leg for 15 years in my corp job. You know, sooner or later, there's going to be an imbalance. And so that imbalance will then be what my homeostasis is, what my body knows to be standard quo. And this is what normal feels like, but normal isn't always good, right? So those are some things to consider. Um, okay, so we'll take a five minute break and then we'll jump into the lab. And then um, Haley, I'm gonna let you lead this through. And then we're going to unpack it and we're going to shift up our cues and our qualities and our, our modifications to reflect that of a gentle yoga class, but we are not going to change the sequencing. And then we can maybe even as a group collectively get together and teach, or if you're really feeling ready for that, then you can jump in at that point. Does that sound good? Okay, five minutes and then we will go. All right, you guys, uh, if you are doing this via Zoom on a not sunny Sunday, uh, for the next hour, just put together a sequence that I've described. Two different creative classes. One will be standing or one will be power yoga and the other will be gentle yoga. And then you can do a series that are either prone um, or standing as we had intended to do, but I think that went to another direction today. So have a great day. Namaste.